Welcome to the Vulcan Lecture Series, Episode 4. My name is Johannes Unterguckenberger from the Research Unit of Computer Graphics at TU Wien, Austria, and the topic for this episode is Commands and Command Buffers. Commands are a very central element, because without them, we wouldn't get any results. They represent any kind of work that we would like a device to perform. As an example, this could mean submitting a draw call to a GPU for rendering a part of a nice 3D scene or maybe of a game. But actually, there are many commands for different purposes, as we will see in a moment. One important point right away, I'll use this depiction of a queue and a command, which is scheduled for processing on that queue throughout this episode and also in other episodes. This depiction always means that the command has already been submitted to the queue, which means that the device has already received the command for execution. As an example, this could mean that your GPU, the device, has already received a draw call instruction in form of a command. So the GPU has parsed the command, it has been instructed to execute, and it is ready to execute the required computational workload. And such computational activity on the GPU is depicted with an animation like this one here, where the command moves through the queue and is removed from it after all computations have completed. The outline for this episode is as follows. First, we will take a look at the wide variety of commands offered by Vulkan and to different types of commands. Then we will get to know command buffers and how to record into them. We will take a brief look at the command buffer lifecycle, as well as primary and secondary command buffers. And finally, we will see how to provide data to commands. Let us start with an overview of the variety of different commands. This slide shows a selection of some of the most prominent commands in Vulkan assigned to different groups. These groups can be divided into two fundamentally different types of commands, which are action type commands and state type commands. Let's start with the action type commands and see which ones we've got. We see commands for draw calls with rasterization based graphics pipelines, where the function names for most of them start with vk command draw. A different group of commands are those representing work that is processed in computator pipelines, the functions of which follow the naming scheme starting with vk command dispatch. And for the third fundamentally different pipeline type, we have commands to start tracing rays using real-time ray tracing pipelines, and the function names for these workloads start with vk command trace rays. Such real-time ray tracing pipelines always require acceleration structures to find out which geometry is hit by a ray, and these acceleration structures need to be built, which is another group of commands on this slide. The function names for these commands start with vk command build acceleration structures. Another important group is the group of transfer commands, which can be divided into several subgroups namely into copy commands, blit commands, resolve commands, and clear commands. In many cases, we can tell by the name of a particular command which group it can be assigned to, like one of the clear commands highlighted on the slide here. These clear commands start with vk command clear. But not every command that starts with that naming scheme is indeed a transfer command. We have one example of a command which classifies as a graphics pipeline command on the slide, although its name starts with vk command clear. It can be found under the graphics pipeline commands group and its function name is vk command clear attachment. In general, You've got to consult the specification for every command you are using in order to find out which group it really belongs to. For VK command clear attachment, the specification says, unlike other clear commands, VK command clear attachments executes as a drawing command rather than a transfer command. 
So you can see that the specification also distinguishes between these different groups and types of commands. In this case, it just calls the commands drawing commands, which I have labeled graphics pipeline commands. I wanted to emphasize the connection to actual graphics pipelines with the name I have chosen. So whenever we speak of drawing commands or draw calls, that refers to commands which perform operations in the context of a graphics pipeline. Besides these groups within the action type region, there is another type of command, which is fundamentally different to the action type commands, namely the state type commands. The big difference between the action type commands and the state type commands is that the former represent actual workload that needs to be computed by a device such as a GPU, for example performing draw calls or dispatch calls or buffer copies, and the latter, the state type commands, represent commands which do not represent computational work, but instead they represent setting a state, which could be binding data or setting some configuration parameters to be used by the action type commands. We have actually already seen the usage of one of these state setting commands during episode 3, namely vk command bind descriptor sets. We have seen an example where this command function was used to bind different descriptor sets for different commands. This is the example I am referring to. To set up a current state, we can use vk command bind descriptor sets to bind descriptor sets a and b prior to recording command 1, which could be a draw call, a dispatch call or a trace race call. So before recording each command, which represents actual computational workload, namely command 1, command 2, command 3 and command 4 in this example, we use these configuration setting commands like vk command bind descriptor sets to establish the proper state for the commands that represent actual computational workload on a device. If we divide this depiction into device and host, we can see that the, that the queue is on the device side. The queue currently has no work scheduled on this particular queue, but we will submit some work in a moment, which is to be performed by the device. Furthermore, the descriptor sets are already stored in device memory, which is why they are also included in the device region. What is currently not on the device are our commands, which have so far only been recorded on the host, that means on the CPU side. And on the host, we have already established links to resources on the device through the descriptor set bindings, like for example descriptor sets A and B for command 1. But the device does not yet know of those established links or about the workload that is about to be submitted to it. Only the host knows so far. But that changes with the submission of the commands to the device. The device receives this package containing the commands which have been recorded on the host and unpacks it, scheduling the contained commands for execution on the queue. What the device also found in the package were the links to the resources which were established through descriptor set binding using vkbind descriptor set at the host site. On the slide, only the bound resources for command 1 are shown for the sake of clarity, but similar resource bindings have been established for all the other commands as well, as we have seen previously on slide 21. The device can start working on these commands right away, starting their execution in submission order. In our case, since only one package has been submitted to the queue, it would start executing the commands in the order of their recording within that package. Some commands are faster to process, others take a bit longer. So it must be expected that they complete out of order, but the device has started working on them in order. And now, processing of all these four commands has completed. Let us go back one step though, and let us take a closer look at the package that we have submitted to the queue. We have recorded several commands into that package and as I reveal the actual name of this package, you'll notice that we are already in the middle of the second chapter of this episode, which is command buffer recording. So whenever we record commands to be executed on a device, we record that into a command buffer. We never submit single commands to a queue, but instead we always record into a command buffer and submit that one. 
Let's remember, we have not only recorded the commands command 1, command 2, command 3 and command 4 into our command buffer, but prior to recording each one of these, we have also established appropriate links to resources by binding suitable descriptor sets and to record that into a command buffer, we have used the function vk command bind descriptor sets highlighted here on the slide. A question you might have is how to know which functions can be used to record state or workload into a command buffer and the answer is all functions which start with vk command. So all functions listed on the slide here must be recorded into a command buffer. There is no way of executing the functionality in any of these functions without using a command buffer. Let us now take a look at command buffer recording in code and the different ways that you can use command buffers. The necessary code for creating a command buffer and recording something into it is shown here on the slide. Command recording happens in the highlighted region. Enclosed in vkbegin command buffer and vkend command buffer calls, we can see that the instructions represented by some vk command functions are being recorded. In this example code, we have a call to vk command bind descriptor sets and the recording of a draw call through vk command draw. Before we can record commands though, we need to allocate a command buffer. And every command buffer is allocated from a command pool. The command pool can be configured with flags, some useful values of which we will see a bit later, but for now, the example code does not set any of them. A command pool must be created for a particular queue family, which is set to the family at index 0 here. <coughs> and all command buffers allocated from this command pool must be submitted to queues belonging to exactly that queue family. Besides these few configuration parameters, the command pool does not require any specific size specifications or such like. This is all handled internally by the drivers. A command pool is created with the function vkCreateCommandPool. And when a command buffer is allocated from that pool, its handle must be specified in a vkCommandBufferAllocateInfoConfigStruct instance. Also, the command buffer level must be specified, where possible values are primary and secondary, which will be discussed a bit later. In this case, it is stated that only one command buffer shall be allocated. And finally, the call to vkAllocateCommandBuffers allocates one command buffer from the command pool. And right after allocation, we can start recording commands into the command buffer. We can see that the allocated command buffer is referenced in every function which records state or actions. As already mentioned previously, VK command bind descriptor sets contributes to defining the state, meaning all kinds of configuration settings used by subsequent action commands. And the state is tracked per bind point. In this case, the graphics bind point is specified, which makes sense in the light of the draw call which is recorded right afterwards. In episode 3, we had this depiction of different sets of descriptor sets, managed independently from each other for different bind points, which could be graphics, compute or ray tracing. Wiki command draw here is recording an action command, namely a draw call, which uses the currently set state. And finally, vkend command buffer stops recording into the command buffer and makes the command buffer ready for queue submission. Let us next see which options we have for queue submission, but in order to show that on one slide, we've got to cut a few lines of code. Let's hide the call to vk create command pool, make the recording section a bit more compact, and keep only the most relevant configuration properties. Please note that you still need the now hidden properties and calls in your program. Okay, so now we have added a render loop and we can see that command buffer allocation and recording is performed outside of it. 
In the loop, we have the instructions to submit the command buffer to a queue. The command buffer is referenced through the p command buffers member of wiki-submit-info. And the instruction which really sends the workload to the, to the device is wkq submit. So that means whatever we have recorded above into our command buffer is sent by wkq submit to the device for processing. Once wkq submit is done on the host side, the device takes over asynchronously with respect to the host unpacks the received command buffer and starts working on the contained commands asynchronously to the host. That means, right after VKQ submit, the host code continues immediately and does not wait on the device for completion of the submitted commands. Keeping host and device in sync is a matter of synchronization, which will be the topic of a future episode. We can see that in this code example, the command buffer is recorded only once, but submitted multiple times, which is one of the typical usage modes of command buffers. We record once outside of the render loop and submit exactly the same command buffer in every loop iteration. Moving on to the second usage mode, namely single use, we have to rearrange the code a bit and we start by providing appropriate flags to VK command buffer begin info. The flag that we have added pretty clearly states that we are intending to submit this entire command buffer only once. We could also consider adapting the command pools configuration by specifying the transient flag. The specification says VK command pool create transient bit specifies that command buffers allocated from the pool will be short lived, meaning that they will be reset or freed in a relatively short time frame. This flag may be used by the implementation to control memory allocation behavior within the pool. And now to the most important change for the single usage mode. We've got to move both command buffer allocation and recording into the render loop. And with that we have properly refactored the code for the single use mode and we have specified the appropriate usage flags for this mode. Please note that this mode can be totally fine. You do not have to try record everything beforehand and only make use of reusable command buffers. In many cases that will not even be, be possible, especially if the instructions to be executed change according to an application's requirements. Examples for such changes could be that a user interface is shown or hidden, or that various parts of a 3D scene are added or removed from being drawn, maybe due to some frustum culling or maybe because new elements spawned in a scene. So most applications will probably require the recording of command buffers on a per frame basis. And while this is not free in terms of performance, recording a few command buffers per frame is usually totally fine. It could be stated that one should strive to record as few as possible, but as many as necessary per frame. Recording efficiency or performance of the single use mode can maybe be improved a bit by the third usage mode shown here, which would be reset and re-record. For this mode, we should add an appropriate flag to the command pool. Namely the reset command buffer flag. The specification describes it like follows. VK command pool create reset command buffer bit allows any command buffer allocated from a pool to be individually reset to the initial state, either by calling VK reset command buffer or via the implicit reset when calling VK begin command buffer. If this flag is not set on a pool, then VK reset command buffer must not be called for any command buffer allocated from that pool. Moving on with our refactoring for this mode. We are going to move the allocation out of the render loop. But command buffer recording remains inside, so we still maintain the flexibility of changing the recorded commands every frame. Note that we are not invoking the VK reset command buffer function in this case, which might still be fine if we check back with the specification once again. It says that there are two ways to reset the command buffer. 
First one is by explicitly calling VK reset command buffer. And the second one is an implicit reset when calling VK begin command buffer, which is what we are making use of in our example code. At this point, we should take a look at the command buffer lifecycle, which is also described in the specification. The different states of a command buffer are described with this nice diagram. After allocation, we start in the initial state. With VK begin command buffer, the command buffer gets into the recording state until we finish recording through VK end command buffer, which brings it into the executable state. Upon queue submission, the command buffer goes into the pending state while it waits to be processed by the device. Given that we have specified the one-time submit flag, as in our example code, we can see that after completion, the command buffer goes into the invalid state, from which it can implicitly be reset by just calling vk begin command buffer once again. There is, however, one thing that we really need to pay attention to in this case, which is that we have to ensure that the command buffer has completed. We won't discuss this in this episode though, since this is a matter of synchronization, which will be discussed in a future episode. But as long as we can be sure that the command buffer has returned to the invalid state in our example, we can safely re-record it with wkbegin command buffer. I would highly recommend reading about the command buffer lifecycle in the specification, and another important aspect which must not be forgotten is proper cleanup and memory management through the functions shown at the bottom of the slide. Let us now quickly talk about the differences between primary and secondary command buffers and what the latter might be useful for. What we have used so far are only primary command buffers. We have always recorded commands into them on the host side, which might imply some performance hiccups on the host side in some cases. A solution to this problem might be to record into different command buffers from multiple CPU threads at the same time. With multiple cores working in parallel on command recording, this process could turn out to be accomplished faster. In this example, we record into one primary and two secondary command buffers in parallel. But only primary command buffers can be submitted to a queue, so we are executing the commands within the secondary command buffers from the primary command buffer, and we can record that into the primary command buffer using vk command execute commands. Now the thing is that recording into multiple command buffers in parallel is not something that is limited to secondary command buffers. Just in the same way it is possible to record multiple primary command buffers as well from different threads. And in terms of state management, we will not gain anything as well, since all state, that means all the script asset bindings and other configuration parameters, is managed locally with respect to a command buffer always. Command buffers do not share any state, and there is no global state as in older APIs like OpenGL for example, where everything is managed as global state. Global state does not exist in Vulkan, and all the state relevant for actions is managed locally in command buffers. This is what actually allows multiple command buffers to be recorded from parallel threads, and is one of the essential aspects that makes Vulkan such an efficient API if used properly. So, only primary command buffers can be submitted to queues, and the actions in the secondary command buffers must be invoked from primary command buffers. So, what might secondary command buffers be good for? Generally, whether or not they are useful can be said in general, but it depends on the situation. Best chances for their usage being advantageous is when used with render passes, which means within rasterization-based graphics pipelines. For further information, I would like to refer you to the article mentioned at the bottom of the slide. As a final item before moving on, I would like to show what the specification has to say about state, which can be found in its section about command buffers. Each command buffer manages state independently of other command buffers. There is no inheritance of state across primary and secondary command buffers or between secondary command buffers. When a command buffer begins recording, all state in that command buffer is undefined. 
when secondary command buffers are recorded to execute on a primary command buffer, the secondary command buffer inherits no state from the primary command buffer and all state of the primary command buffer is undefined after an execute secondary command buffer command is recorded. There is one exception to this rule. If the primary command buffer is inside a render pass instance, then the render pass and subpass state is not disturbed by executing secondary command buffers. And with that, we move on to our last topic in this episode, which is about different ways how data can be provided to commands. And actually, this is all about different ways how action type commands can be provided with data. Let us start with the way we already know, which is establishing links to resources through descriptors. We have talked about this in detail during episode 3, where we saw how different types of resources can be referenced from descriptor sets, which we have allocated from a descriptor pool and written the resource links to. When action commands are submitted to a queue, such descriptor sets can be bound and accessed by the commands during execution. One example of such a descriptor could be a combined image sampler, as it might be contained in descriptor set D in this example, which refers to both an image and a sampler. In GLSL code, this can be accessed through a uniform sampler 2D. For other resource types, please refer to episode 3. The next way to provide data to commands is through push constants. Push constants means a very small amount of data that can be stored in a command buffer itself. You might have even spotted the appropriate command function on one of the earlier slides. Such push constants can be provided to all the types of actions which also descriptor sets can be bound to, namely graphics pipeline commands, compute pipeline commands and ray tracing pipeline commands. Push constants are very limited in size. The specification only guarantees a minimum size of 128 bytes per command. It could be that a certain device allows a bigger push constant size per command, but you cannot rely on that. As already mentioned, such a push constant size limit is always per command, not per command buffer or anything else, but per command which supports push constants. So there could be one such small package of push constants for command 1, another different one for command 2, and maybe command 3 is a command which still is an action type command but does not support push constants. Examples for such a command would be vk command copy buffer or vk command copy buffer to image or such likes. And maybe command 4 is one which supports push constants again. The push constants data is stored within the command buffer and when it is submitted to the queue, the push constants are submitted along with it. They are provided to the respective commands during their execution and, as the name indicates, remain constant. The relevant API structures and functions are listed on the slide and the connection to GLSL shaders can be established like in the code shown here. There is a special layout specifier for push constants. The data stored within push constants can be freely defined. It must just match the data on the host side in terms of size, but also in terms of proper variable alignment and, as mentioned before, the maximum device-specific size must be obeyed. Moving on to the next way of passing data is simply through parameters. This way is mostly relevant for the commands which do not provide support for programmable shader pipelines or a high degree of customizability in general. A prime example would just be an action command like vk command copy buffer, which just takes source and destination buffer handles as parameters. These two still refer to resources in device memory, like these two highlighted here, just we do not need to access them through descriptor sets for such a simple task like copying data from one buffer to another. The relevant buffer handles are just passed directly in this case, 
along with the configuration struct instance, which specifies the exact amount of data to be copied and which offsets to use. In the example on the slide, one megabyte is copied from the source buffer at offset zero to the destination buffer starting at a one kilobyte offset with sizes specified in base two. Okay, so much for parameters. Let us now move on to the final way, which is attributes. Attributes are specific to graphics pipelines, no other type of commands supports them. Also, they only apply to classical graphics pipelines and not to the modern mesh shader-based rasterization pipeline variant. The slide shows pipeline stages of a minimal vertex shader-based graphics pipeline and above the vertex processing region we can see the vertex input stage, which is the stage that receives these vertex attributes as input and from there they are passed on to the vertex shader for further processing. In a vertex shader, we can make a layout declaration and specify a numbered input location for receiving a VEC3 value, which is interpreted as a position data in this example. Multiple such input attributes can be declared at different input locations. Here we have three of these declared, a VEC3 for a position, another VEC3 for a normal and a VEC2 for texture coordinates. Let us move back one step though to only one input attribute, namely a position, and let's see how to establish a setup to stream such attributes into vertex shaders. First, we have to declare a VK vertex input binding description for the bound input buffer, which will provide the data. We set it to binding number zero, which will refer to a certain buffer bound to that binding number at index zero, which we will specify later, just before recording that raw call using VK command bind vertex buffers. There is a parameter to this state setting function, which needs to be set to that binding number in order to establish the link properly. Furthermore, we specify that the vertex input rate shall be vertex, which means that one value of the buffer is streamed per vertex. And the third important parameter of VK vertex input binding description to be set is the stride parameter, which specifies the offsets between two consecutive records of data in the input buffer. One record within this input buffer could be declared like the struct shown here. If we assume that multiple such records are stored in consecutive memory, that means that each entry contains three float values, then the subsequent entry starts. Therefore, the right value for the stride is the size of three floats. The format of three float values must be set even more precisely with another configuration struct, <coughs> which is of type VK vertex input attribute description and has a format member. The format specified here says that the data for the first attribute is three 32-bit signed float values taken from an offset of zero with respect to one of the input buffer's records. Where that input buffer the data is taken from can be found at binding number zero. And the data is going to be streamed to location zero in vertex shaders. We can see on the slide that the location numbers in host code on the left hand side and in GLSL device code on the right hand side match. These configuration instances need to be wired together in a VK pipeline input state create info config struct instance to set it up properly for usage within a graphics pipeline. Let us now move on to the case where we have different data stored in one record of our myvertex data struct, namely a position, a normal, and texture coordinates. We need to refactor our code a bit to set up the configuration for this case properly. We start with the stride parameter, which must now reflect the larger size of our input buffer records. We increase it to eight float values. Then we need to add additional attribute descriptions, one for each attribute. One for the position, one for the normal and another one for the texture coordinates. All their binding numbers still remain set to zero, since we stick to using one single input buffer. 
but the location numbers must be different from each other because they represent the target locations for our vertex shaders. Let's display the vertex shader code once again, where we can see that the location declarations match the configuration on the host side. Also the format specifications match on the host side and in vertex shader code. We just need to pay attention that the offsets are set up properly with respect to the data in one record of the input buffer. Let us refactor one more time into a different format for the input data, where we are using three different buffers for the different attributes instead of putting everything into one buffer. In the memory diagram I have hidden the VK memory regions due to a lack of space. But of course the backing memory for each of the three VK buffers is still there. First of all, we are changing uh, all the offsets to zero. Because every attribute streams the data now from its own buffer and in every case right from the beginning of a record. We must also change the binding numbers which refer to buffer input bindings because we are not using one buffer but now we are using three different buffers. Now I'm going to compress the attribute description code a bit so that we get some room for further VK vertex input binding descriptions. And add one VK vertex input binding description for each input buffer. Every one of them refers to a different input buffer binding, which we then just need to ensure to bind the right VK buffer to. And that can be established with code like shown here, where all three input buffers are bound in one go, the first one bound to binding ID 0 and the next two to the consecutive binding IDs 1 and 2. With that we have reached the end of this chapter and also the end of this episode. I hope that you found the provided information about commands and command buffers interesting and helpful and I would like to thank you for your attention.